Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Danaretti to introduce our guest. Thanks, Kent. Um, well, we're honored today to have Jeannie Morazzo here, who is, uh, probably doesn't need an introduction because everybody knows who she is. She's a world-class leader and researcher, clinician in pre HIV prevention and HIV care, and uh, an author of the recent prevention guidelines in clinical care settings, and that's what she'll be discussing here today. Great. Thanks, Sharisha, and thank you so much to the ECHO team for um, inviting me to talk about these guidelines. Um, I do have slides that provide a nice summary, and I, I don't want to take too much time to go through these in detail, but I did want to give you a sense of, of what these guidelines were about. So it's an interesting um, process to bring together a group like this. I, that's the first thing I will say. And, and this, this, uh, these guidelines resulted from the Inter International Antiviral Society, USA, um, recognizing in the last couple of years that there really was no comprehensive, accessible, kind of just really focused recommendation for integrated biomedical and behavioral prevention recommendations. You know, the CDC's document hasn't been updated in a really long time. Um, there's a PrEP document now from the CDC, but nothing that really tried to kind of summarize the state of the evidence across some of these different disciplines. So basically the IAS USA, who I think you all know um, puts out antiretroviral therapy guidelines, convened this very diverse panel to try to consider some of these issues. And the end result was a paper that was published in JAMA last July that was uh, a compendium of the recommendations and was in the special issue that JAMA um, releases every July uh, that focuses on HIV AIDS. So we were really delighted to have these guidelines have uh, such a high profile because I think a lot of people saw them and it came out uh, at the same time as the Melbourne AIDS conference, so pretty exciting. So I don't think that I need to talk to this group too much about the justification for these guidelines. Clearly, um, you know, treatment as prevention is, is working great. I just came back from Cape Town on Saturday and there was a, a very br big um, uh, research for prevention conference about HIV and, and I think very encouraging data on um, the role of antiretroviral therapy and the impact it's making, particularly in South Africa. Um, but I don't think anybody's expecting that that's going to turn the tide really quickly, and so biomedical prevention um, still is is having a huge role. There, you know, I think one interesting part about um, uh, PrEP in particular, and I'm going to talk about PrEP, that got a lot of play at this meeting was people really sort of um, confronting what some have uh, seen as pessimism about PrEP. I don't know if you guys have felt this, but there's been a lot of discussion about how, oh, people aren't really using PrEP. You know, it's out there, but I haven't really been asked for it. And there was just some great discussion about how every single biomedical innovation, almost everyone that's come out in the last probably 100 years from uh, oral contraceptives to tampons, for example, have generally taken between 10 to 20 years to really sort of uh, impact um, sort of uptake in society. I don't think we'll have to wait that long for PrEP, but I do think it's reassuring um, to, to note that sometimes these things do take time. Just in terms of the rationale for the guidelines, um, you can see that uh, there are some statistics there, and I think they'll come as no surprise to you. I think what was new about this effort was that we really tried to integrate biomedical and behavioral experts as well as recommendations, and frankly, that was probably the hardest thing about putting this uh, document together because they are not always often on the same page. Um, and we really also wanted to uh, target these two people who are seeing patients in primary care. We were not writing them for HIV care specialists. We were not writing them for any particular group, but really for all people um, who were providing care. And then the other thing I'll mention is that we, we, we considered the entire continuum of care and we looked at interventions that could be targeted at different points in the continuum of care. And that was a little bit uh, unique. And I just put this reminder um, here, obviously these numbers are going to differ depending on what setting you're in. But this is sort of a snapshot of where the continuum of care, what the continuum of care looks like in the United States uh, as a whole. In the Northwest, we're probably doing quite a lot better than this. Um, if you look at our data, at least in Seattle, King County, we probably have viral suppression um, in closer to maybe 60 to 70 percent of people, uh, but that clearly is not the way that things look in the rest of the country and indeed in the rest of the world. No matter how you look at it, even if you're succeeding in suppressing people, we're still looking at about 50,000 new infections um, per year in the United States, and I think all of us would agree that that is pretty unacceptable. So these are the sections of the guidelines I just want to talk about very briefly today. 
We wanted to start by reviewing HIV testing and knowledge of serostatus because that's entry uh, point into the care continuum. Talk about prevention measures for people with HIV, many of whom I know you're, you're, many of you are taking care of those folks, and then prevention measures for people who don't have HIV, and then general prevention measures that would be relevant to everybody uh, with or at risk for HIV infection. Um, and this is just a summary of the points I'm going to be making, so I won't take you through this slide. So the first section, HIV testing and knowledge of serostatus, again, no surprise uh, to you that we pretty much just um, uh, repeat the recommendations of the CDC. What we did try to do, though, was to unpack some of these, um, I would say, platitudes and really try to get a little bit more specific in some of the detail. So we really wanted people to think about doing good HIV risk assessment, including sexual and drug use activities in all adults and adolescents. It's a little harder to do. It's easy to say, but harder, easier said than done. And then um, remind people that for some, many people at risk, obviously one-time testing is not enough. And you have to do these things, uh, these risk assessments fairly frequently, even if you think you know your patients pretty well. We also made it clear that it was important to let people generally know they were being HIV tested, even though those guidelines have changed. Um, but emphasize that pretest counseling should be sufficient only to meet the individual's needs and comply with local regulations. In other words, be very permissive about HIV testing. Um, ref, you know, honor the right to refuse testing, but make sure that those refusals are informed decisions. And we had some very interesting ethical discussions about this section. I also remember that people who are at ongoing risk um, should know about the possibility of a false negative test. And then just um, really sort of saying very clearly that we should be using tests with the best performance, and that means best sensitivity, best specificity, and if you're seeing somebody who you think won't come back for their test results, that rapid testing could be very, uh, very valuable. Um, couples testing should be accommodated and encouraged, and then self-testing and home testing should be considered for those who have recurrent risk, difficulties with testing in clinical settings, or both. So nothing, nothing too outlandish, I think, but gives you some sense of how we tried to get into some detail about areas we felt uh, might lend themselves to more specific recommendations to empower uh, clinicians to really implement these um, in a way that maybe goes beyond just the CDC saying you should just test um, everybody at least once. What about antiretroviral therapy? Uh, again, no surprise to you, we, we uh, amplified the recommendation that everybody should get um, an offer for antiretroviral therapy upon detection of HIV uh, infection and that strategies for adherence support should be implemented and tailored. Uh, and a reminder that people need to know uh, about the possibility of acute HIV infection. In, the, um, in several of the PrEP studies, including the IPREC study, you may recall that the people who were found to have acute but uh, at that time undetected HIV infection at enrollment, actually many of them were symptomatic. They didn't have the classic retroviral sort of syndrome that we think about or acute retroviral syndrome with a rash, the fever, the sore throat. Um, but a lot of them just had very nonspecific symptoms of viral URIs or upper respiratory infection. So in people who are at high risk, remember that these um, acute infections can present in a very wide variety of nonspecific viral kinds of ways. And then um, we had, as I think I alluded to, a very vigorous debate about the role of counseling on risk reduction. Um, that was probably, again, the hardest part to come to some consensus to uh, or consensus with. Uh, we ended up saying that there is uh, probably some value to individualized risk reduction counseling uh, among people with HIV, but the data really are um, you know, somewhat mixed, and I think that makes sense. We haven't seen a decline in HIV infections in the last 10 years, so presumably people's behavior really isn't changing uh, that much. And I, I think given our current epidemic of syphilis and gonorrhea in the HIV care setting, um, I think those of us who are skeptics about behavioral counseling um, have some evidence uh, to back up our skepticism. On the other hand, people do deserve, I think, individualized risk reduction assessment and counseling. And then we really wanted to make a strong statement about 
um, partner management and disclosure of HIV serostatus. I would say that's something we don't really pay a lot of attention to as, as clinicians, but uh, people here have been very interested in this. Helping people tell their partners, get their partners tested um, is often difficult, but really, really critical to care. We really did stick our neck out, I would say, in the um, drug use section here. We actually went so far as to say that medically assisted therapy, which includes not just opioid substitution therapy, but even medicalized heroin, which is available uh, in British Columbia. Julio Montana was on the panel, and you may know he's quite a, an advocate for uh, pretty advanced care in this population. So we really felt like this group needed to be, uh, be emphasized in a way that many of the previous recommendations has, have not done. So we really felt, um, felt strongly about treating drug addiction uh, with as much medical uh, support um, uh, as possible. Obviously, that's going to vary a lot depending on where you live and what the regulations are. It's not Vancouver, uh, even in Seattle, but I think it's, it's certainly worth knowing about those programs. And then uh, risk assessment and risk reduction for HIV infection. Um, this is pretty similar to what I talked about before, but now we're moving into people who don't have HIV. And I think the comments that I made before about this stand pretty well um, in, that, in that, um, that area too. And then the last part of the talk, well, the second to last part, um, just is to look at some of the more formal biomedical interventions um, that I've been um, alluding to. I already talked about immediate antiretroviral for HIV prevention um, in an HIV positive person in a discordant partnership. You know from the HPTN052 study that that resulted in a really remarkable reduction um, in transmission within couples, 96%. So that's clearly on the top of the evidence scale, and you can see that in the red uh, circle at the top of this nice graph. Um, medical male circumcision for heterosexual men for the benefit of the male partner reduction of about 50 to 60 percent depending on the study you look at important to know it does not benefit female partners and in terms of male to male sex probably not so much data are lacking and there are no trials so some inferential evidence I would say to say that maybe for the insertive partner who's putting his penis in his partner's rectum um, not surprisingly it may help but it's not really really I would say robust evidence and then those PrEP trials, pre-exposure prophylaxis, range from really fantastic protection in the HIV negative partner. So of course, this is when the negative partner takes PrEP. In these cases, it was Truvada, tenofovir, emtricitabine, or tenofovir. Um, and there is a range of studies. The best evidence comes from the partner's PrEP study, and I say best, meaning that it was the highest degree of protection for uh, provided by PrEP. And that was a study in which they enrolled both members of serodiscordant couples. So a really unique study design that allowed people to really, um, really participate. Worked great in, those, in that study. Um, and it moves down. You can see the efficacy in the IPREX study of daily um, oral Truvada relative to placebo was 44%. So that was men who have sex with men. Adherence in that study was not great. Um, and then when you go down to the two studies in women, FemPrep and VOICE, um, the efficacy was very, very low, and that was almost all related to a lack of product adherence in those studies. So what did we say about PrEP? Well, we basically say that it should be offered based on those um, studies that I just showed you, and it would be really important to target it at people who are at considerable risk. And what did we define as considerable risk? We said greater than 2%. We got that from some cost-effectiveness analyses uh, and some other data. Um, I really think that we wanted to emphasize recent diagnosis of incident STIs in important populations. So men who have sex with men who don't yet have HIV but have gotten syphilis, gonorrhea, or chlamydia, perfect, perfect, perfect population to think about PrEP. If you see somebody who's used PEP more than twice in the past year post-exposure prophylaxis, I think it makes sense to talk to them about PrEP. And then people who inject drugs, a nice study in Bangkok showed that daily oral TDF FTC worked in them as well. I think the main thing that this rather dense text tries to convey is that 
PrEP is not a magic bullet. It really has to be part of an integrated risk reduction strategy. And I think the best thing about PrEP being available is that it's probably forcing conversations about some of these other aspects of prevention that we just don't always have with people. For example, STD risk, STD screening, and drug use behavior, and even sexual addiction uh, behavior for that matter. So uh, very, very important considerations that are also embedded in there. And just a reminder that you want to be sure people don't have HIV when you prescribe PrEP, so have a very low threshold for waiting until you confirm that. And remember that you do need to have uh, normal renal function as well as no evidence of chronic active hepatitis C. Won't spend too much time talking about post-exposure prophylaxis. I think you all know that that has been, um, the guidelines for PEP have been modified um, and now um, recommend Truvada and Raltegravir and, and that regimen is, is widely available. And then the last section is uh, really about general recommendations for people um, who are at risk for HIV. And just a reminder that test screening and treatment for sexually transmitted infections is, is really important, both as a way to identify people at risk for HIV, but certainly among people with HIV uh, to help treat those infections. Um, almost certainly STIs, particularly at the rectum, we don't know for sure, but we think um, increased genital HIV viral load even when you have suppressed plasma uh, viral load. So really a good idea to treat those, detect them, and ideally not to get them. Um, remember that hepatitis C is also can be an acute sexually acquired um, uh, infection in men who have sex with men. We've been seeing that um, in our HIV care clinic and in our STD clinic and remind yourself uh, of that and sometimes all you'll see is an asymptomatic transaminitis and that can resolve in a surprising proportion of people. And then quadrivalent HPV vaccination should be offered uh, to everybody uh, with HIV consistent with the ACIP recommendations. It's safe and it's active, effective in that population. Um, and don't forget about H. BV or hepatitis B vaccination. And then finally, HSV2 or genital herpes um, infection, lots of debate about this and its role in sort of synergistically increasing risk of HIV acquisition, transmission, and maybe even affecting the natural history of HIV. Uh, we ended up just saying that you might want to consider screening for using a type-specific serology uh, because I think the data uh, to say that we can intervene to improve HIV natural history are really not quite clear, but I do think it's helpful for people to know their status. They can prevent transmission and they can also prevent um, uh, recurrences by taking suppressive antiviral therapy. So I'm going to stop there and uh, take questions, I guess, right?